our loving Heavenly Father. During these perilous times, as we face a formidable foe that has shaken us to the core, we draw near to you, our Creator and Sustainer of this universe. You are our Sovereign Lord and you remain on your throne. None of these crises has passed without your notice or permission. And so we rest in you, our refuge and strength, our very present help in trouble. We cry out to you on behalf of the nations. Save, O Lord, our hope is in you. May you rid our world of this virus that has afflicted hundreds of thousands. May you fulfill your purposes in the face of this crisis. May the nations draw near to you in humility, repentance, and faith in Christ. And may we see your unmistakably gracious hand in our healing. Overwhelm our national and local leaders with a sense of accountability to you for the people you have called them to serve. Just as our Lord Jesus felt compassion on the people when they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd, may our leaders work from a heart of humble, compassionate service and not lord it over those they were given charge. Grant them godly wisdom to lead effectively and efficiently. We pray that you would provide especially for the vulnerable, the poor, the sick, the elderly, and those whose livelihoods have come to a halt. May you swiftly channel to them the resources they need to survive and recover with dignity. Show us how to be the church among them and love them like Christ does. We pray for our frontliners, Father. How many of them have lost their lives to serve the people? They remind us of our Lord Jesus who laid down his life for us. Grant them your special favor, strength, protection, and provision as they help our fellow men. Breathe your special breath upon the sick that they may be able to recover completely. Give them new strength, O Lord. And for those whom you have chosen to bring home to yourself, O Lord, grant mercy even as they are on their deathbeds. Bring to their remembrance the good news of Jesus and help them to respond in faith. Speak words of hope and comfort and please provide for the grieving families they leave behind. We pray for protection and provision for your church, Lord. We pray that you would protect and provide for our families. Help us to be good stewards of one another, encouraging each other in the faith, bearing one another's burdens and helping each other in concrete ways. As you strengthen our faith, make us a beacon of hope in our words and actions to those whom you are drawing near. We entrust our future to you, Lord, knowing that you have seen everything from beginning to end. And when you bring us out of this crisis, help us to remember the lessons you have taught us and not to revert back to our old ways. All this we ask in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Psalm 46 God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders, and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Psalm 46 Good morning. 
We are now in uh, the month of April and I would like to announce that we are temporarily suspending our sermon series from Nehemiah to give way to a series of messages that will encourage us uh, and uh, keep our faith in God in the midst of the difficult time that we are all going through in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic. We are calling uh, this April sermon series, uh, Trusting God in Hard Times. I would like to begin the month with a message from Psalm 46. I've entitled my message for today, Being Still and Knowing God. Psalm 46 is a song uh, for Zion, which is Jerusalem, the holy city of God. Uh, this psalm is all about uh, security with God. It is mostly written in the third person, but uh, at verse 10, there's a change and God speaks directly. He says, Be still and know that I am God. Throughout the 11 verses, we also read uh, several descriptions about God, His characteristics and attributes. He is our refuge, He is strong, He is present, and a great help in uh, times of trouble. Um, he is higher than all else and able to rule above all. His voice is all-powerful. When He speaks, the earth melts. He is with us. He is a fortress. Somebody you can run to and find protection and uh, safety. The psalmist is uh, probably living through some very difficult time, perhaps war, as he mentions the phrases uh, trouble, the nations in uproar, kingdoms falling, bows, spears, and shields. Yet the psalmist is looking forward to a future time when wars will cease and there will be peace. The emphasis or emphasis in this psalm is on the presence of the Lord with his people and the difference it makes when we trust in him in the difficulties of life. The psalm focuses on the Lord and what he is to his trusting people. Now here's an interesting info for all of you. This psalm was the inspiration for Martin Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It may have been written following King Sennacherib's attack on Jerusalem. Sennacherib was the king of Assyria at that time. Sennacherib reigned from about 720 BC to about 683 BC. The ancient capital of Assyria was Nineveh, where the prophet Jonah preached a warning message of destruction from God many years earlier. During the reign of uh, King Hezekiah in Judah, uh, Sennacherib invaded Judah and he was bent on conquering Jerusalem. Assyria had already conquered uh, the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC and had taken the people there captive. Now, who was Hezekiah? Hezekiah was only 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned uh, 29 years in Jerusalem. He was a very good king. He stopped the practice of idolatry in his kingdom. He also obeyed the Lord uh, very faithfully. He was also successful in war. He rebelled against the king of Assyria who wanted to conquer the surrounding nations. Hezekiah did not want to serve him. In the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, Assyria attacked Judah. The army of Assyria was very, very strong. Hezekiah knew he could not win against the enemy, so he tried to pay off the king of Assyria with silver and gold. This did not work. Sennacherib still wanted to conquer Judah. The military officials of King Sennacherib threatened the people of Judah. The people were still safe inside the wall at that time. The men of Assyria told the people of Judah to surrender, otherwise they will be slaughtered. Hezekiah consulted the prophet Isaiah. What will we do? And Isaiah replied, The Lord will deliver us from the Assyrians. He was so sure of this. 
Later, the Assyrians uh, sent a letter to King Hezekiah. In the letter, they ridiculed and belittled the God of Hezekiah and the residents of Jerusalem. Hezekiah went to the temple and spread out the letter from Sennacherib before God and asked God to save Judah. Isaiah sent a message to Hezekiah. He told him that the Lord has heard his prayer and that the Lord will not allow the enemy to enter the city to capture it. That night, the angel of the Lord went into the camp of the enemy and slaughtered 185,000 soldiers and officials of the Assyrian army. Because of this, Sennacherib withdrew and went back to his country. Later, uh, two of his sons murdered him while he was worshipping his god in their temple. By the way, you can read all about this uh, very exciting story of how God uh, was able to deliver his people and punish his enemies in uh, 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19 and in 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and in Isaiah uh, chapter 36 and 37. In fact, it will be good for you if you pause the video for a little while and read the account, at least in uh, 2 Kings, uh, for you to have a better appreciation of Psalm 46. Now, broken down into three parts, the Psalm could be divided, divided as follows. Number one, God is the defense of his saints. That's verses 1 to 3. And then God is present in Zion or where his people are. That's in uh, verses 4 to 7. And uh, finally, that God will be exalted in the earth. That's uh, verses 8 to 11. Our nation is currently uh, not at war with another nation. And so Psalm 46 might not easily resonate with uh, one who reads it. But there is turmoil going on in our midst at this time. We are at war with a disease that is making people sick and it is causing the deaths of many already. Our lives have been disrupted. People are getting sick. Some people uh, are wanting for food, for resources, and there are people who are going hungry. You are afraid to go out because you might get infected. And there's curfew at night. Our government is facing a, a severe crisis. And it is not just our nation, but all the nations of the world, all the nations of the world as well. We really are living in troubled times. Now, if God were to speak to us through Psalm 46 today, what would be his comforting and reassuring words? For that, I would like to focus on Psalm 46, verse 10, only a very popular verse. And uh, it says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Let me take up the first phrase. Be still and know that I am God. Uh, the, the first uh, phrase is, Be still. Psalm 46 verse 10 is a popular verse for comforting ourselves and others. And many people tend to think that this verse means to rest or relax in who God is. Well, this verse does encourage uh, believers to reflect on who God is. But there is more to this psalm if taken its, in its context. Be still is written in the context of a time of trouble and war. Therefore, we should consider the verse with that context in mind. If we look at the various Bible uh, versions, we will see that it is also rendered as cease striving or simply stop. The people of God should interpret the command for themselves to read more like, Hey, snap out of it or wake up, stop fearing. Acknowledge who your God is. Be in awe of Him. Be still uh, literally means 
take your hands off, relax. You know, we like to be, you know, hands-on people and uh, manage our own lives. But God is God and we are but His servants. Take the case of Hezekiah. Because Hezekiah and his leaders allowed God to be God, He delivered them from their enemies. That was the way King Hezekiah had prayed. Listen to his prayer. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know you are the Lord God, you alone. 2 Kings 19. There is a time to obey and act, but until then, we had better take our hands off and allow him to work in our in his own time and in his own way. Many of us have been so busy in our work, business, or studies that we have lost the discipline of you know quiet meditation in our lives. We only devote a few quality minutes of our time with God. We only find time to be with him when we have our morning morning devotion, but not really practice the presence of God throughout the whole day. Some also think erroneously that ministry can replace intimacy with God. It does not work that way. Spending time with God is not the same as serving God in and through ministry. If one is very busy and is immersed in work, it is easy to miss those signals from God that call us to be in a quiet corner with Him and be intimately acquainted with Him. If God were to speak to us, perhaps He would tell us to, to just slow down, to take a break, to cease from worrying. He might say, hey, you're working yourself to death, climbing up the corporate ladder. You're tiring yourself. You're losing sleep over things that are temporary. You're sacrificing your health. Am I not providing enough for you? We are facing a battle with a coronavirus that we are not familiar with. Yet many people are so busy coming up with their own ideas of, on how to beat the enemy with supposed cures that are born out of their inexperienced minds. Why not rather allow the scientists and medical experts to handle it? Why not be still and ask God to give these professionals the wisdom and strength to find a real cure? That is something that we can all do. The coronavirus crisis has sidelined us. We all need to stay at home. Perhaps that is also God's way of telling us to be still. Staying at home should enable us to reconnect and bond more with our families, even to catch up on our sleep and heal our tired bodies. One good thing that has come out of the quarantine is the clearing up of uh, the skies, the atmosphere. With the smog gone, the air is cleaner and fresher. God is giving time for the earth to heal as well. It will be good for us. I think God wants us to do a favor here. We need to take advantage of it. Rather than go out, stay at home. Let us be still, pray, and commune with God. So after telling us to be still, God says, no, no. No in this instance means to properly ascertain by seeing and to acknowledge, to be aware of. Acknowledging God implies that we can trust Him and surrender to His plan because we understand who He is. To know God means to acknowledge and commit to the fact that God is the only refuge worth running toward, the only refuge that will stand strong through every circumstance. One commentary says this, The psalmist goes on to encourage the godly, referring to God's people, to know that the Lord is God. Though it was tempting to ally themselves with foreign powers, to rely on the military strength, or to give themselves over to idolatry and pagan ways, the godly must learn to persevere to the end. 
The believer must know that God is able. Yes, our God is able. He is powerful and able to serve or to save and deliver. One can only do this if one knows God personally. It's And it's not a matter of just knowing about God, but knowing God in a personal way. Some commentaries uh, differ on whether to interpret verse 10 as God speaking directly to the enemies of the people of God, or God speaking to His people, or God speaking to both His enemies and the people of God in different ways. If God were talking to the enemies of Israel, they would be the pagan or heathen nations. In this case, God is calling on His enemies, nations who don't believe in Him, just to stop fighting against Him and start getting acquainted with Him as the one true God, all-powerful and mighty. He is calling on them to yield to Him, to accept His sovereignty. He warns them that if they persist on going against Him, they will only bring more trouble, troubles upon themselves. Now, if God were talking to believers, what He is saying is to acknowledge that He is the God of the Bible. He wishes to be intimate with His children. It's not just head knowledge. That's not enough. He can be known in a deep and personal way. And He is inviting His people to get to know Him and experiencing more. If you are a believer, you can say that you already know God. But can you say that you know God intimately? That you know God on a deep level? If so, are you acknowledging His Lordship in your life? Are you trusting Him at this time of difficulty? Or are you relying more on yourself to survive? Are you running to Him for safety, for refuge, for safekeeping because you believe that there is no one else who can truly protect you? Do you acknowledge God for who He truly is? Some of you who are listening to me might ask, Who is this God that I should put my trust and faith in? Now that is a good question. Let us then talk about Him. In the final part of the sentence, God introduces himself as God. He says, I am God. I am God. Now, thinking correctly about God is of utmost importance because a false idea about God is idolatry. Who is God? To start with, a good summary definition of God is the supreme being. Capital S in Supreme, capital B in Being, Supreme Being. He is the Creator, capital C, and Ruler, capital R, of all that is. He is the self-existent one, who is perfect in power, goodness, and wisdom. Here's a question for you. Is this your understanding of God? Who is God? What is His nature? We know certain things to be true of God for one reason. In His mercy, He has chosen to reveal some of His qualities to us. God is Spirit. God is one, but He exists as three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God is infinite, incomparable, and unchanging. God exists everywhere knows everything, and has all power and authority. Do you accept these qualities of God? Who is God? What is His character? Here are some of God's uh, characteristics as revealed in the Bible. God is just, loving, truthful, and holy. God shows compassion, mercy, and grace. God judges sin, but also offers forgiveness. Have you experienced the goodness of God through His character? Are you experiencing His love, grace, and mercy every day? Who is God? What are His works? We cannot understand God apart from His works. 
because what God does flows from who He is. Here's a short list of God's works, past, present, and future. God created the world. We find that in Genesis chapter 1. He actively sustains the world. He is executing His eternal plan which involves the redemption of man from the curse of sin and death. He draws people to Christ. He disciplines His children and He will judge the world. Who is God? How can one have a relationship with Him? In the person of the Son, Jesus Christ, God became flesh. The Bible says He dwelt among us. The Son of God became the Son of Man. It is therefore the bridge or to lie between God and man. It is only through the Son that we can have forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with God, and eternal salvation. In Jesus Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So, to really know who God is, all we have to do is look at Jesus. Have you already experienced a personal encounter with the Son of God? His name is Jesus Christ. Have you experienced His saving grace? How then should we respond to the God of the universe who tells us to be still and know Him? Number one, look for no other God. The God of the Bible is the God that we must truly know. This is the God that we must acknowledge and trust to deliver us, especially in times of difficulty. Number two, cease from striving. Cease from worrying. Present your worries to God. Present your cares to God and allow Him to show His power to answer you and to deliver you from all your troubles. And then thirdly, know this. God is not surprised by anything. He knows what is happening in the world, and He is in complete control. He can merely speak His word, and the coronavirus will dis disappear from the face of the earth. Let us continue to pray that He will do that for our sake and for the exaltation of His name. Amen.